I think there's also some really interesting things happening just in the interstate space. Um, so I'm going to introduce our next panel who has really um, an incredible amount of expertise on community investing. It's, it's led by Amy Cortez. Uh, who's an award-winning journalist. She's an expert on local vesting. In fact, you could say she wrote the book on local vesting because she did write the book called Local Vesting. Yes, she did. Um, so we are really honored to have this panel here together. All right, so while we're miking up, um, welcome to the um, panel on how Regulation A is going to transform uh, community investing. So this is a topic I'm really excited about. Um, um, and I think we just had a great lead-in from Jean, so um, thank you, Jean, for that. So, um, Amy Cortese, um, I'm a journalist, uh, probably best known in, in this crowd for um, some of the stories I've done for the New York Times on crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, including one uh, just a couple of weeks ago on um, crowdfunding municipal finance, uh, which was actually an interesting uh, topic I didn't know much about before. Um, and I'm also uh, the author of Loca Vesting, as um, Dara pointed out. And I just want to give a little background on how that book came about, because I think it's relevant to this conversation. Um, so I wrote it in the wake of the financial crisis, when a lot of um, jobs and um, savings and communities were um, really destroyed. And people were looking for ways to um, invest in their communities um, and their local businesses and really help rebuild after that crisis. Um, because Wall Street surely was not gonna be the one to do that. So I wrote about all of these people um, searching for and actually creating these models from slow money to direct public offerings to local stock exchanges and crowdfunding. So this was, um, the book came out in 2011, so it was um, pre-Jobs Act. Um, and, and now, this idea of investing in your community, whether it's a geographic community or an affinity group, is really gaining steam. And from a lot of different quarters, um, um, from crowdfund the crowdfunding world, um, but also from impact investing uh, people, it's a big topic at um, SOCAP, if anyone's ever been to that conference. Um, and also from economic developers who are looking to create ecosystems to support their local entrepreneurs. Um, especially in areas that are, you know, far from the money centers and the major major um, um, cities. So there's been a lot of change and there's been a lot of innovation, but I think there's also a lot of confusion, right? I mean, this stuff is complex, um, and this is, you know, confusing both um, on the part of entrepreneurs and investors, as well as that broader ecosystem. Um, so I recently launched uh, something called locavesting.com, um, playing off the name of the book. Um, so it's a media and educational platform um, that seeks to address this knowledge gap and cover um, the evolution of these new funding models. Um, so I like to think of it as the intersection of uh, financial innovation and community. So please take a look, locavesting.com. I have to do my own plug. And um, I put some postcards out on the far tables by the refreshments. And um, I, I should just mention, we have some really great sponsorship opportunities in case anyone is interested. <laughs> All right, so um, we're gonna talk about um, Reg A and community offerings. Did this just go off? Um, and how they're opening up brand new opportunities for community investments. Um, now, is reggae the answer? I personally am not sure about that, but um, it's the best we have right now to work with, and we have a really great panel here today to discuss this. So I'm gonna ask everyone to um, briefly introduce yourselves. Dara, do we really only have a half hour? Is that true? <gasps> Gypped. Right, okay. Um, so yeah, if everyone could be brief, um, and we'll start with Dan, who is fresh back from his honeymoon. Uh, so my name is Dan Merlin, the co-founder and president of Fundrise. Uh, we were the first real estate crowdfunding platform in the country and actually began using it. So we started in 2010, took us 18 months of filings to get our first offering done and raised $325,000 from 175 investors for a deal in Washington, D.C. So from us, our background was in real estate development and the idea was why don't we allow the individuals that actually live in the community and spend time in, in the area, why can't they invest in real estate nearby them? So 
that's where the idea came. We've now scaled to do um, projects across the country, but it really came from the fundamental concept of you as a resident, why don't you have the ability to invest in a deal across the street? And traditionally, you didn't, which we thought was a pretty crazy concept. I'm uh, Howard Leonhardt from uh, Leonhardt Ventures and the California Stock Exchange. Uh, most of my life I've spent uh, inventing products for treating heart disease. And uh, when you're in the biomed business and you're a CEO, by default, you're in the capital raising business. And uh, over the years, we raised $145 million that we invested in 30 different innovations in our field. And uh, along that path, we were doing crowdfunding before crowdfunding was cool. And uh, we had to follow the rules at that time, which were quite expensive, including doing an IPO. In 2008, we took our stem cell company for regenerating damaged hearts public. We raised just under $7 million, and the IPO cost us $4.8 million to raise $7 million. Uh, coming out of that, I was angry, and I got involved with uh, financial reform, and that brought me uh, here today in, uh, in a short story. <laughs> well done. My name's John Pigott. I um, work with a company that I've co-founded called Ape Now. My background is first as a corporate securities lawyer, and then when the SEC passed Reg ATS in 99, I had the same idea about 100 other people did, which is to start a fixed income trading platform for the retail bond market to help retail bond investors be able to electronically execute on a product. Uh, it was 92 competitors, then 50, then three. Five years later, it was two of us. Uh, I sold it to Knight Capital Group and the European Operations to Lending Group. And that platform handles about 28% of all the bond investing that retail investors do in the US now. So we had an exchange in the background and a white label product that about 30 online brokerages used. So my background is in building trading systems and then linking up and then watching what retail investors are really looking for in instruments online, which turns out to be very different than the products that most of us bring to them most of the time from the street. So we look to bring that type of experience and background and attitude towards the, uh, towards the equity space. And we'll speak more specifically about that in a minute. I would really encourage everybody to buy Amy's book and read the blog. I am on it a couple times a week. It's excellent. It's a media site, not a blog. A media site. <laughs> Excuse me. Media site, of course. The epicenter. All right, great. And yes, we'll talk a lot more about um, exchanges. But first, Dan, I want to go back to you because really, no one was doing Reg A deals when you did that. Like, I don't know, there might have been a handful in like a decade. So how did you, like, how did you hit on Reg A? You exhausted all your other options and then you went on to do two more, right? So yeah, we, you just crazy? We didn't or? know what we were getting ourselves into, I think. Um, it really began with my brother and I were doing real estate development in Washington, D.C. and we felt you know, traditional large private equity funds and a lot of the deals we were doing really didn't fit. They wouldn't invest equity less than 10 million in a lot of markets. That's a big chunk of market they won't touch. And they wouldn't go in neighborhoods that were growing and dynamic, but they had never heard of. So we thought, well, this would be a great alternative. Why don't we go to the people that live in this neighborhood? They know the building, they know the tenant moving in, they're perfect person to invest. And we kept going to securities attorney after another of, you know, why, why can't we let these individuals invest online into our deals? And everyone kept guiding us towards Reg D. They said, first, it's a waste of your time, and then second, it's not possible. And eventually ended up, through the head of internet enforcement at the SEC, got a referral to an attorney uh, who's really just kind of the fixer, had previously worked at the SEC, was now in private practice, guided us towards Reg A. We met with him. He said, it's totally possible to do what you're trying to do. It's going to be slow and expensive. So at that point, we just thought, you know, there's, there's such unmet demand here. Or that was our view that if you could give individuals the chance to own commercial real estate, it's an asset class they should have something to do with. And there's an emotional connection there. It's a thing that they can connect to. So it took us about almost half a million bucks on the first deal to raise 325000 So I think we, we ra actually spent yeah. more legal than we raised, even though you spent more total. Um, but we got... We proved a big point, and, and there was an article in the Atlantic City that kind of outlined what we're doing, and we had an outpouring of support from real estate companies and individuals all over the country reaching out to us saying, you know, I'd love to use your platform. At that point, we were the real estate company and the platform, so we had to separate the two and spin out the platform, but there was really huge unmet demand for real estate companies looking for a certain size and type of capital, and from investors and individuals who just felt the, the desire to invest in real estate and be a part of their community. So. We realized we hit on something, and then we started to kind of raise money for our company to scale it. 
Unfortunately, most of the deals we do now are limited to accredited investors just because we're now raising for other real estate companies. If you go to them and you say, you can raise under Reg D for 5K or you can raise under Reg A for 100,000 and a year of filings, you know, they're going to pick the, the more efficient path. But we hope with Reg A plus, with regulation crowdfunding over time, that burden will be eased and you'll, you'll really allow individuals to invest in it. So it's a little bittersweet that we really pioneered it, but it became so cumbersome and expensive that we've had to limit the amount of deals we do. And we only do a few a year, such as uh, the redevelopment of the old Tiger Stadium in Detroit, where there's a really big narrative and a reason why we're willing to spend the money to do it. Okay, and um, before we move on, um, I, I just read that you did something in Oakland with the Convention Center, and that's being open to the public. So how are you doing that? Sure. So that that's, talk about that deal. Yeah, that's through reggae. We do a lot of uh, public-private deals. Same with the Tiger Stadium deal. The city has a piece of land. They're offering for development. You know, the politicians can either offer it to the private billion-dollar pension you know, or investment fund or invest, give the group that, that has some local investors a chance. So we found with RFPs, the dynamic of allowing individuals to own even 5, 10% of the deal really changed the dynamics from selling land off to some billion dollar fund to actually allowing the people who are affected by the development to, to own some of the upside. So most of those deals, because government deals are so slow, you actually can time the, the speed of the reggae with it. And because the deals are 30 to 50 million, an extra 100K of legal actually isn't that big of a deal. So we found that they have to be bigger deals with a slow time frame. Um, but hopefully over time we can find more ways to allow individuals into all the deals. And the interesting thing about that one was that the city of Oakland actually asked um, developers to consider um, public investment in, in the RFP. Um, so we're putting a, a new asset class in, in the hands of um, the public, right, with these public offerings of private companies. And Howard and John um, are both um, focused on exchanges um, for trading these new securities. So um, first of all, how important is liquidity when we're talking about the retail market? Well, it depends largely on the expectations coming in, first of all. If they expect, if they're investing in what they know is going to be a five to 10 year note, then the expectation of liquidity is one thing. If it's an internet stock, of course, it's something very different. It also depends on, I think Reg A in particular gives us the opportunity to kind of redefine liquidity to fit more closely what these deals support and what retail investors in particular want. Uh, in several other countries, and I've done some of the implementations with stock exchanges, when you have a low, low liquidity product and low liquidity market, you, you know, it's all about managing time and space of, of the trading, of the marketplace. So you can unify t us place and putting it on one site for time, you can do it instead of an on-the-run trading like we have for NASDAQ and NYSE on Reg and MS, you can do consolidated uh, auctions, either once an hour, twice a day, once a day. So you can define liquidity and aggregate order flow on both sides uh, in a way that fits the product and fits the market. I, I wanted to add that uh, there's this big division between being a private company where you cannot sell the shares and you're locked up and a public company on NASDAQ. And a big hazard uh, or problem that exists is that in lightly traded small companies on NASDAQ or OTC markets where there's a lack of, of trading volume, uh, you create a phenomena that is actually terrible. And interestingly enough, the best analogy I can give is a real estate analogy. If you live in a neighborhood where there's $100 million homes and somebody in your neighborhood decides to panic sell their house and offers it at a million in, at 8 a.m. in the morning, and then quickly drops it to 800,000, 500,000, 200,000, 100,000, then sells it at 4 p.m. in a panic at 100,000. If that's a stock, every other member of that neighborhood, of the 99 other people, their value drops to 100,000. Even though only, it was only one person that panic sold and one buyer transaction, uh, the stock is always priced on the last trade. Now, theoretically, if you have a market, somebody should see the opportunity and come up. But uh, what happens is that with your lightly traded stock, it's very much like real estate. Everybody can understand when you sell a house, you're not going to sell it in a minute like a NASDAQ trade. It takes time to find a buyer. You have to do marketing. And small stocks need that same kind of marketing. They're not going to instantly get the highest price in one minute like a high volume NASDAQ stock. So we need this interim venture exchange, uh, something in between being private where you can't sell at all and something uh, uh, where you're you're not going to reach the unrealistic expectation of having the high volume trading of a top NASDAQ stock. And that's where venture exchanges can come in. 
Okay, well, since you bring up venture exchanges, right, there's a lot of talk about that at the SEC, but um, at the same time, we have um, states uh, that have passed crowdfunding um, uh, exemptions within their state, uh, interstate exemptions. Um, we have some states talking about doing local exchanges, so for those state securities. Um, so how is this going to play out? Do we need national exchanges, local, regional, vertical? Like, what does that look like? Whoever wants to take it. Um, I think the whole definition of exchange is going to change. I mean, we've got a lot of gap. After 2000, as David Wield's analysis points out, I'm sure everybody's, most of us at least have seen it, after the year 2000 collapse, we stopped underwriting and bringing to IPO market companies that were worth less than $2 billion. That market stopped by 95%, and it really never has been resurrected. Even with the Jobs Act changes for a quick on-ramp for an IPO process, of the companies that have used that to do an IPO, over 87% of them are biotechs. So it's working for a small, narrow band, which is a very important band, but for the rest of the economy, that's just not bumping the needle. What we have an opportunity to do is to have um, a different type of cross-matching mechanism, which is about 98% cheaper to, um, to operate and to bring to market than NASDAQ or NYSE, and have that in an auction-based or whatever cross-matching methodology and have it on a community base, whether you define that community horizontally within industries or vertically within geographical areas. Um, and I, the, the, we basically don't have IPOs, 200 million to $2 billion outside of biotech. And that part of it, I think, is definitely coming back. And what's the timing on both of your projects, your exchange projects? In our case, we uh, published uh, recently uh, a five-year plan. Um, the publication of My Social Good News, uh, run by Devin Thorpe and his uh, colleagues, uh, published that. And uh, the short answer of a five-year plan is that uh, the next step for us, the California Stock Exchange is designed to be a stock exchange for the future. It's designed to only list companies that have a strong innovation culture, test high for treating their employees well and their community well, and have a sense of purpose. So it's spo supposed to be a marketplace where if you're an investor who believes that Companies that treat people well are going to recruit, retain, and motivate talented people to excel, uh, that this is going to be a marketplace for you. But it's a big step for us as a startup to jump to become a stock exchange. So an intermediate step uh, is that the next big step for us is to create the CalX 30 either index fund or exchange traded fund. So we're in the process of evaluating 30 stocks that are listed on NASDAQ, not on our stock exchange, that will be bundled into an indexed fund and we will provide research reports and we're grading them on innovation culture, the vision of the company, a sense of purpose, and uh, we hope, uh, we have a simple goal for the Cal X30 is to beat the Dow 30, and the idea is that we would advertise in the future that if you want to invest in companies that treat people well, and you believe that that's a better way to have sustainable profits and returns over the long run, we're gonna be the marketplace for you. Thanks for the All advertisement. Right. <laughs> and timing quickly, John. Yeah, quickly on our end, we're looking to a launch in the first quarter of this coming year. And we'll, what we're looking at is a shared infrastructure for state-by-state -state exchanges. We have about eight groups within different, eight, groups within eight different states now that have, um, that have approached us that we've, we've done transactions with. And so we'll be launching them throughout next, next calendar year. Shared infrastructure, so the cost of deployment is fairly low on a state-by-state -state basis shared technology, all online, all using a common infrastructure, but with local ownership of the actual exchanges themselves, somewhat of the model that MTS used in the 2000s in Europe, where you had a common fixed income market, but every country, the main players, um, owned a piece of that country's exchange. So we do think that the markets continue to be somewhat geographically or vertically oriented, because that's where you live your life in physical space and uh, so that the exchanges will be, will be designed around that. Great, that's fascinating. Um, so here's a question, because this has always um, perplexed me, right? In the beginning, the main role of a stock exchange was um, capital raising, right, in the form of um, issuance of stock, either an IPO or even a, maybe a secondary offering. Um, now the focus is on trading, um, and some might say speculative trading. I have a stat. Um, from my book, and I, I think it was 1% um, of all the activity on exchanges today is related to capital raising, and the rest is all trading and speculation. So, um, and you know, at the same time, 
um, as Dara points out, growth companies um, are, are waiting longer to go public, and it's sort of become this exit strategy for the early investors, you know, who are um, benefiting from the, the bulk of the wealth creation. So my question is, how do we make this better? How do we have a better exchange? And you know, why shouldn't like the issuers that like the crowdfunding platform also be trading, right? Because that's that's kind of what stock market is today. You issue and you trade, and here we're kind of separating it. So how do we make it better, and do we need different platforms, or does that come together, like does Fundrise have secondary trading of their securities? I mean, the, the first thing that's going to happen that I see rolling out with all these platforms and several others is the cost of all this infrastructure is going to drop by about 98%. I can see us going into a, a sort of Moore's Law, like they have for computer chips, for the cost of financial products, and for basically offering up services for people's financial lives. There is a lot of reason to have expensive infrastructure to trade $200 billion stocks, because you literally have, we have sub-microsecond liquidity in those stocks. There's no reason whatsoever for real estate deals to need sub-microsecond liquidity and for 90, for 80% 80, 80 of the share, 80% of the stocks listed on NYSE, NYSE and NASDAQ have a market cap of $2 billion or less. Well, they trade once every 10 minutes, once every five minutes. So the 800 million to 1 billion and a half uh, cost of annually pulling off the type of stock market those stocks need is completely irrelevant for the rest of the market. And so we're seeing matching up infrastructure costs, which brings down trading costs tremendously, and it also, I think, will lead to a blend, what's happened in the fixed income space, which is a blend of the, um, of the primary and secondary markets. With some of the bond issues now, it is almost harder to distinguish which is primary and secondary market. Like the revolver notes like Tom Ricketts uh, in Capital or Chicago, uh, some of the mini ARS platforms, and uh, I, think, I think that that's playing out in the equity space. It's a big question, uh, how to improve exchanges. We could talk for hours on that. but. A, a couple of uh, key points is that uh, we intend for the California Stock Exchange in the future to have no day trading, uh, no short trading. Uh, exchanges, as long as they stay within the bounds of the laws, they can create additional conditions. And as long as it's disclosed to everybody, for instance, NASDAQ says has limits on bro brokerage commissions, that is not a federal law. That's, that's just NASDAQ decided on their exchange they want that rule. You can have rules in addition to the laws, as long as the rules don't conflict with laws. So we intend to have no day trading, no short trading. And uh, I mentioned earlier, a big one is that timing the, the volume of trading of a particular stock with the buyers. And again, using the housing analogy, you don't expect to sell a house in a minute. You expect a certain amount of marketing time. And, and uh, you know that uh, if you panic sell, you're going to sell for less. But if you allow for time to find a buyer in proper market, eventually it matches up. That housing analogy I gave earlier, that house that sold for 100000 actually probably was worth more like 900000 or a million. But they just didn't take the time to match the buyer with the seller. Uh, and we would provide that timing. Uh, windows of trading uh, could be considered uh, based on the volume. Uh, there are many other things that could be done to improve exchange, but that's just a, just no a couple. No co-location, no <laughs> derivatives. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think, you know, what, what you said regarding the costs and, and basically efficiency of the whole thing, the problem is, is just the legal framework and the cost to actually go public, raise capital. Our reggae was half a million bucks, and we were innovating, and I'm sure someone else was doing it as well. There was no kind of standardization. And now, at least our view of crowdfunding is the sourcing and underwriting of deals and closing is relatively traditional. It's a distribution of the deal that's fundamentally changed. We can take a deal, send it out to over 100,000 people online, digitally, for no cost. They can transact through ACH at a couple pennies per transaction. That distribution is normally 10, 15% cost, either through investment banks, through financial advisors. And so you look at the ability for technology to distribute these, these shares and deals at a much lower cost. It's definitely going to happen. And so I think the next three to five years are going to create the frameworks that will then bring the cost down. And it's similar to what e-commerce did, it's similar to what Facebook, Twitter, and blogs did, the media publishing and distribution. I think the same thing's going to happen on the capital side now with the new regulations and tech. And so I think that's really where it needs to go. I think when AOL went public, they went public at $90 million to raise $10 million. They actually went public to raise money. I mean, the idea of a, of a company going public at $90 million seems crazy, but it was because it was a source of capital. And so I think 
that's really what's broken. You know, an IPO is an exit now. It's not actually capital formation. And so the more that you can bring the cost down, bring direct distribution, cut out intermediaries, you should be able to allow capital to come in earlier in the process, which, which is good for everyone. Because the financial markets work pretty well at a billion plus. Major financial firms have tons of access to capital. It's a small, medium enterprise in every market, in real estate, in small business, pretty much across the board, that's where the issue is. So it's not even an industry thing, it's just a structural thing, and that's why we started. Funds wouldn't invest in deals that were less than 30 million total deal size, which was a really arbitrary distinction of why would that number matter, but it's because that was the cost of their infrastructure. So I think the technologies can bring that down. I think it'll be good for, for everybody in the broader economy. All right, um, really great stuff. Um, so adoption of Reg A and, and interstate offerings as well, this is awkward positioning here, um, has been pretty slow, okay, but not surprisingly being brand new. Um, what will it take to mainstream this, this sort of investing where the public is investing in private companies? Um, you know, do we need funds? Do we need, um, you know, to take the due diligence work out for individual investors? Maybe we need um, I due diligence. Uh, <laughs> um, so what, you know, what do you guys see? <laughs> I think the first step that would help a lot, and it's happened, it already happened in a couple of the bond markets back in the 90s, the municipal bond market, is a standardization of the corporate structure and of the product. Right now, every stock that's sold into the market is basically a bespoke, handmade suit. And frankly, we could buy most of our clothes right off the rack and it would be fine. And the SEC has done a lot of good studying in this. Larry Harris, when he was chief economist there, that the cost of, of bespoke tailoring of these securities is far more expensive than the actual economic benefits that they create for issuers and for investors. So if we can standardize products, uh, that helps a lot. It also adds credibility in the investment experience because there's no secret clause 746 on the 800th page of the offering. Uh, if you can bring an offering statement down into 20 pages, it has a completely different credibility experience for investors. So that's, the, that's a huge, that was a huge driver of liquidity and also of reestablishing int the integrity of the experience in the retail bond market. And I think we're going to see that play out in, in all these uh, stock markets. I think a big part of it is marketing at, at all levels. And uh, one thing we can learn from that, uh, I, I live in Los Angeles now and there's the YouTube revolution happening. And uh, YouTube uh, in, has very many uh, correlations with the broadcast yourself. And uh, instead of having middlemen and record companies and movie companies decide what goes out for people to digest, people started just going directly to the market. And what's happening is that people are learning how to market and engage with communities. And what a big development is networks are developing under specialties. You can find a network that just shows independent shows on love stories, you go to the love network and you can see 12 different programs of love stories. Or if you're a pilot, you can go to a, a pilot network and watch 12 different shows that are related to pilots and their love of flying. I believe exchanges in the future are going to be very much like this, just like magazines on the shelf. There's magazine for NASCAR people, there's magazine for pilots, there's magazines for people who love romance, and there's going to be stock markets that go around engaged communities where there's research, there's engagement, and there's integration between the customers and the people, the issuers. In the case of YouTube, the issuers are the people that create the YouTube videos, and it's phenomenal. It's caught, in, it's, it's caught the uh, entertainment industry off guard and that you know Macy Kate goes in her garage in Boston 17 years old and she has 8.2 million views the next day on her video that's more than the people that watch NBC News on a given night uh, this is gonna happen in the financial world as well I think it is working it's just very small so it's hard to tell our, our first year our average raise is about 300,000 bucks then 800,000 then a million and a half now it's about three so it's very small in the overall financial system, but it, it is growing very quickly. The biggest constraint is the inability to allow individuals non-accredited to invest very easily. That's 97% of the population. Once that hits, it's really gonna drive. But I do think back to what combination of what they said, you're gonna have standardization among specific platforms that do verticals. We do real estate, someone else does infrastructure, someone else does small business. That allows kind of a standardization to lower the cost of the offering, and it also allows people to connect to that specific product type. But I really think it is working, it's just gonna take a while. 
Um, and it's going to go through a few cycles. Right now, everyone's very excited about crowdfunding. There'll be a downturn, and then everyone thinks it's a disaster, and then it'll come back. So we're very early in what I think is a 10 to 20 year cycle of the financial industry really being chopped down by technology. And, and so I, I, even though it feels like very frustrating that the SEC is still sitting in a lot of the rules, and it's not going as fast as, as we'd like, you know, I think it's really a 10 to 20 year view on this stuff, and it's going to have a big impact over time. Great. Um, I have a couple of questions queued up um, in, you know, on my own, but um, does anyone in the audience want to ask a question because we have this great panel and if there's a burning question, um, I'll let you ask. Okay, back here. I actually, I lived in Brazil for years, so I've been looking at it for Fundrise. It's just the regulatory structure is the difficult part, but the technology and everything else is very replicable. But, you know, we're looking at UK, the same thing. There's just a different framework for every different market. But once you figure out the structure and the framework, um, but I, I really think it's going to be global. I mean, we, we're the first real estate crowdfunding platform. There's now over 100, probably half of those are abroad. So I, I don't see any reason why it's limited to the US, but I think the US was going to drive the innovation and then will be exported abroad. One comment in that regard is that I just recently have been studying wealth inequality. And wealth inequality is 10 times worse than income inequality. And this is not just a problem in the US. This is a problem worldwide. And if you look at the charts of wealth growth over the last 20 years, it's phenomenal. If you just looked at that, you would think, wow, everybody must be happy because we've increased the, the wealth uh, so much across the world. But as you know, in Brazil and in the US, uh, a good large percent of the population isn't participating in that. And what's needed is somehow, some way, for the people that have been working in lower wages to be able to pr participate in owning appreciating assets, either homes or a assets that grow. The way the wealthy get wealthy is not from wages, it's from appreciating assets. And a good part of the population in the entire world has been excluded from that opportunity. And somehow, some way, worldwide, this has to, has to be changed. Wow, well that is a rousing way to end thank this you. panel. Thank you. thank you, Howard, and thank you, all of you. For, uh, thank you.